All right. Welcome, everyone, to Social Selling Hour on this December 8th. We are excited for you to join us again on this Monday. Myself, Brian Fanzo, I social fans on the Twitters, here with my amazing co-host, Rachel Miller. Hey, everyone. All right. And we are here today uh, kind of bringing in a new topic. We've got some uh, exciting guests. This is actually episode number 29. So we couldn't be more excited about that as I, we start wrapping up 2014 here at the, the last month of the year. I, I'm not sure we could have dreamed of the lineup of guests and the, the awesome community that you guys are um, on Twitter as well as on Google Plus and those that watch this on YouTube live um, on replay. Actually, if you can see, I actually had to get a new chair because my chair has been worn out. So that's how uh, <laughs> I'm excited because I have a new chair. And I'm also excited um, to have a friend of mine on. Okay. and. Uh, expert in the social business realm, a podcaster, um, a man of many talents as well as has a podcast about social selling, talks about social business, is an IBMer as well. So uh, Jim, welcome to Social Selling Hour. Hey Brian, Rachel, glad, glad uh, to be here. It's great to see you guys. And it's All great right. to see you, literally. I know. See, we, yeah. see each other. we look each other in the digital eyeballs. Although you are one of the few guests that I actually have shaken your hand in person, yeah. so we have met face to face, which is <laughs> which is usually rare for our, our our list of guests. It's usually you're a guest, and all of a sudden we meet face to face, and it's like, hey, yeah. I, I met Jim Sheehan about three weeks ago in person for the first time, and and some other guests. So we're so glad to have you on. Give us a little background about yourself, um, not only what you do at IBM, but what you do with your academy and uh, your podcast as well, and then we'll jump into 360 Networks. Yeah, great. So, uh, so with IBM, I'm really focused around digital engagement uh, worldwide for IBM, helping IBMers, our partners, our clients, you know, engage in digital and social. And uh, I do a lot of coaching and training and and podcasting, as you mentioned there. And I also have, you know, kind of as part of that, um, the Executive Social Academy, where basically I like to bring everything outside, you know, the proverbial firewall. And you know, try and help uh, you know our partners, my colleagues in IBM, and our clients and our users um, wherever they are in the world. And so, I'd like to bring a lot of content there on the Executive Social Academy to help people try and make you know, everything as accessible and and as open as possible. And I have uh, three podcasts there, like you said, <laughs> keeps me busy. The Ask Jim podcast to talk about IBM connections, which is all about enterprise social collaboration, like in you know internal or external platforms, and one we talk about uh, from selling to serving, which is around uh, social selling and brand advocacy, and then a newer one which is interview based, which has been a lot of fun around social business unboxed. So getting you know stories and insights from people who are in different parts of the social business. Uh, uh, you know, portfolio, if you will. So, yeah, so it's been a lot of fun. So I'm gonna tell you that you know, I a lot of people give me flack and say I have the dream job and I do everything. Like I'm in every media on all <laughs> over the place. But you, you might be my, I might be your biggest fan because I can now point to you and say, see, I'm not the only one that's uh, uh, doing yeah. podcasts and and, and uh, you know, spreading. I do social selling. I talk social business. I have Cloud Talk now on on Thursdays. I'm actually releasing my first podcast this week. I will th drop that as my plug for uh, Smack Talk. Which will debut this week with uh, my my partner at Broadsuite, Daniel Newman. But I, I love that not only do you do different media, but you're engaged in in Twitter chats. You have podcasts, you have some webinars mm -hmm. that you're doing. And I think IBM has done a pretty awesome job at um, not only allowing their employees to become the face of the company. And I, I give that uh, to I give IBM credit for that. A lot of times, even when IBMers aren't on the show. And um, yeah. you know, and with that being said, I think that's the perfect kind of segue into what we're talking today with 360 Networks and. To caveat that, I, I actually was telling Rachel before the show, I actually credit much of my success that I've been able to have in my career based on strategic network building. And, and I mean, I was able to grow early on in my career way faster than most would have ever expected. And it was, it was partially right along this thinking that you have for three set, the, the term 360 network. So I love this topic. I'm excited to kind of explain it as well as linking it to the social selling community because yeah. you know, we talk about relationships and networking, but I think how you kind of paint right. that picture is pretty cool. So question one, what are the characteristics of a 360 network? Give us a little bit about what it is, where it starts, and then kind of how it all plays together. Yeah, so yeah, that's a great point. And uh, I really like to think of it this way. You are as smart as your network. And by that meaning, 
you know, it's really not about what you know. You know, each of us are subject matter experts in in different spaces. And but you know, as we work with our customers or our partners, you know, the communities that we serve, we're not always uh, we don't know everything. And so it's really you know, in today's connected social economy, uh, it's really about tapping into this, uh, you know, I think of it as, you know, collective knowledge. And when I talk about 360 networks, um, and thanks for sharing that post there from the Ask Jim, that's uh, actually one of the top uh, episodes on, um, on the Academy there. Episode and, 91, I just listened yeah. to it for a second <laughs> yeah. time this morning, so I know I'm familiar with that one. Yeah, so, you know, really that came about, um, you know, as we talk about customer experience, right? And uh, a 360-degree network, in a nutshell, is really with you know being purposeful and very intentional. It sounds like you did that early, early in your career. There is just being very intentional about uh, building connections with people in your organization, in your community, in your network, you know, partners or your ecosystem around the different touch points. Uh, of your customer or um, you know the customer experience so you know not just within your immediate group if that's in sales or you know professional services group or marketing but you know marketing sales public relations technical support product development engineering legal finance so I found that um, developing this 360 degree network makes you know, enables a smarter network that you can tap into. So when you do get that question in the future from, you know, a prospective buyer, uh, one, you know, a colleague, uh, a client, that you may have the right answer at that time and, and can come right back to them. Or if you don't necessarily have what you think is the best answer, you can pause for a sec and go to your network and consult your network, um, you know, to get different inputs from different you know perspectives around that 360 degrees so that you come back with the best answer from your collective knowledge and experience uh, and insights and I think doing that you bring a lot more value to whomever it is you're serving so you know I, I love that quote and one of the quotes you know it's you know, it's not what you know it's but it's who you know and I always add on to that and I say it's not actually who you know it's actually who you know that knows what you don't Right, because right. I think that's that's the key value. It's you know if you're partnering or aligning with everybody in the same exact circle and the exact same you know interface as you, what value does that have for your gaining of knowledge? Or you know it kind of comes into that if you're the smartest guy in the room, then you're in the wrong room. You know right. I think I think that really is a big part of this, and I love that because when you when we when you think about a partnership, especially from a customer facing in, environment, I think too far too often they assume. If I'm customer facing, I really only worry about all these people customer facing. But right. the more advocates and the friends that you have in the back room, in the product team, on the accounting team, the more people that you're in touch with those, when you are stumped or you do need the help, and that's your reach back. I mean, I think that's probably one of the most powerful ways to to really excel is to have all of these, you know, links into all these different networks. Right. And um, I'm looking at it right now, just so I uh, oh gosh, there it goes, sorry. Um, so I can pull this up if you can see this. Super Connect. Super Connect. You know, I read this uh, a couple years ago, and this really changed my thinking. And I really encourage people to check this out and you know listen to it, audiobook or uh, read it. It's by uh, Richard Koch and Greg Lockwood, and uh, I believe Richard is the uh, author of the eighty twenty principle. But um, you know that really opened my eyes to this whole concept of weak links, and you know, in a network, you touched on this a little bit. It's not only today just who you know in your immediate network, but you have this fantastic serendipity effect of people in those secondary and tertiary networks, so that people you don't even know who may not even be in your immediate network may see an ongoing conversation in social, and say, "Hey, I know something about that." Or I've had experience, you know, with that situation. Or hey, you should talk to so and so, and jump in, and you know, contribute a great idea or a great solution or suggestion. So, um, 
I think that that really helped me kind of think about this 360 degree network concept. So. Yeah, I think a lot of the people listening today are familiar with the concept, but perhaps not the term 360 mm -hmm. network. I know that, that was the same for me, and we have some people on the stream. Like, they're the, I think they're everyone's nodding their heads like, oh, right, I know yeah. what that is. I belong to one. But, um, and also how to leverage it. Um, you yeah. know, it is about who you know, but then asking the right people at the right time I think is a struggle for a lot of people. So I hope that's something that we can cover further on yeah. in the chat. Yeah, so... Certainly one thing in that, I think, um, you know, if we talked about, you know, 360-degree networks and, uh, you know, also uh, do, um, doing a talk tomorrow on the connected enterprise. So, you know, one thing I think people can really leverage in uh, their, I'll say, social selling, you know, brand advocacy efforts is really on their, especially the larger the organization, leveraging an enterprise social collaboration network to build, you know, as the, you know, platform, if you will, to build that network and, you know, cultivate those internal relationships and, um, you know, be proactive in asking those questions. You know, obviously not for every time you have a question, but when, you know, you have a tough challenge, a business challenge, or a need from a client or customer, um, you know, so be proactive in, you know, reaching out to that network um, you know, and asking for help and posing an ask, you know, to the community. And I know, you know, like one of the things, um, I know Rachel works for uh, Pipeline or CRM, but one of the things for, you know, CRM and when we talk about people management, I, I talk right. about it a lot on the idea that I record where I engage most with someone because I want to mm -hmm. know that if I have to reach out to them, it's on Facebook Messenger or if it's on a DM on Twitter or if it's better tweeting. Right. Like a lot of people realize that if they send me an email, it might get a net response that day, but if they send me a tweet, they'll probably get a response that minute. And um, you know, one of the things that goes along with that is I always had, and this was something I, I credit my mentor, uh, Sandeep Call, my very first VP that I ever worked for back at BAE Systems uh, in 2003. And he uh -huh. told me about. Uh, he told me he said, "Okay, Brian, why don't you pull up your calendar?" He's like, "Every Wednesday at 3 p.m., I want you to block off from 3 to 4, and I want you to put in there. It says, go connect with the third floor.'" And I. I worked yeah. on the first floor. I was an entry-level guy. And so every Wednesday at 3 p.m., I would walk around the third floor and try to reconnect, say hi, and I was never out of sight, out of mind. And as yeah. I worked from home, and I, so I still have that notification in my calendar today. And every Wednesday at 3 p.m., <laughs> it actually comes up, and I, and I will send an email, check in on somebody. I'll, yeah. I'll Facebook message them. Because I think building those connections and saying, hey, I do need to be aligned with somebody in the accounting department. Yes, it's great to shake their hand, but you have to continue and foster that relationship. And I think that's where a lot of times people forget. And to me, if I don't have a notification that's not on my calendar, I will forget. Yeah. And I don't want people to think I, they're not a priority. But that's just one of my tricks. What are some of the other things that you like from a from like a continuing to grow that 360 network? Yeah, absolutely. No, those are great points. Um, and I, I do the same thing. You know, I kind of you know, calendar, put it on the calendar and, you know, I think of it as nurturing blocks, you know, to um, make sure you, I devote, you know, focused and intentional time to building and nurturing relationships. And I really like to, uh, well, you know, I talk about in the From Selling to Serving podcast, there are a lot, I really like to think of it as, you know, paying it forward. So, um, one analogy I I think about all the time is, you know, when your house is on fire is not the best time to go and introduce yourself to your neighbor asking that, you know, see if you can borrow the hose, right? You know, you want to pay it forward. Look for opportunities where you can help people in your network and, and serve them and, you know, contribute value to what they're working on. So when you need something, you know, you can go back and, and ask, but you you know, in order to do that, you you have to have, you know, an ongoing nurturing, you know, relationship. And yeah, that's uh, so it can't point. always be about asking, right? Introducing yourself like and giving. saying, hey, I need to borrow your car now is not usually the great, you know, saying, hey, it's me again. You know, that, that it's, that's actually right. a really valid point. And so, you know, I love this concept. I love, and I also am a geek for technology, and I, I use the quote all the time that I use tech and automation so I can be more human. <laughs> 
So yeah. when we think about mobile, I know you're doing a lot of stuff with you know, a mobile, uh, a couple of different campaigns that you have with mobile uh, way to work, how mobile works mm -hmm. with customer engagement. So for question two, we were going to kind of talk about with this engagement, with these networks and building this 360 network, what is role does mobile play in this whole customer engagement? Um, even in, in I, I consider customers internal as employees mm -hmm. and external as the ones that keeps your paycheck coming. Yeah, well, there's some interesting uh, statistics. I was just looking at some data this morning. I'm looking at right now the IBM Digital Analytics Benchmark study, and there's a, a Thanksgiving Day, Black Friday, and Cyber Monday uh, data analytics that we've been running, and it'll be continuing to run through the holiday season. Um, but just to give people kind of a sense of the rise of mobile, uh, for Thanksgiving Day, for the first time, mobile accounted for more than half of all online traffic, 52.1%. Mobile sales reached 32% of all online sales. Black Friday, mobile devices accounted for one in four online purchases. <laughs> Cyber crazy. Monday, mobile traffic accounted for 41%. So, um, and there was another thing here which was a really key finding. Um, people were really using smartphones today as kind of a, a shopping uh, advisor, you know, a device so they can in real time, whether they're online or in a physical store, do research on something that they're buying, you know, price comparison, consulting their social networks, uh, looking at online reviews, etc. And then completing the transactions on their smart or on their tablets. And um, the data from these studies was purchased by tablet was 12%, purchased by smartphone was 9. But I think uh, I was really, you know, struck by the, you know, this rise of the digital shopping assistant, you know, kind of to think of it that way. And then the other thing we really see uh, across at least, you know, the companies that we're working with and particularly with uh, those that we call the pace setters, is really focusing and obsessively focusing on the user experience. And so uh, if you think of that as, you know, different channels, so, you know, the in-store physical experience, you know, the online website or different mobile platforms and uh, social engagement with the brand, um, creating a seamless experience across all of these devices so that the customer has a consistent, you know, experience on whatever screen they're viewing on. So, you know, things like uh, mobile, you know, responsive design, right, is really critical. I mean, I think that's interesting. I mean, I actually, I think if you're shopping today without, you know, browsing on your phone or in interacting on your mobile device, I think not only are you mm -hmm. getting probably scammed, but I mean, you're missing the aspect, you know, I, I love, I mean, Amazon, living in Arizona, Amazon gets delivered almost <laughs> sometimes the same day. So I, yeah. I'm, very, I'm very lucky that I can order something in the morning and actually it'll show up the same day, which is not a, a not normal for everyone. But, right. you know, I, I don't even think of it as a window shopping anymore for yeah. a brick and mortar. I think of it as comparison anal analytics, and I read reviews. Right. Like, I, I firmly believe... And I also mm -hmm. think the power of your network is important when it comes to those yeah. reviews. Because, I mean, we both, I mean, the podcasting is an interesting one, right? Podcasting is great because, I mean, there's some great review sites that are out there. I know Jay Bear just right. uh, released a marketing uh, podcast site to find marketing podcasts. But yeah, it's great. Podcasts, I mean, the first thing you do when you look at a podcast is yeah. probably even before people listen, they go back and look at all of the reviews of those uh, of, of the podcast that people are putting in there and and just like that's kind of our shopping experience and how do we do that it's mobile devices and i think you know the, mm -hmm. the the telling one there of the stats that you gave yes the smartphone to me is a big one but uh, the the increased use of the tablet is also a big one because yeah. you know the tablet is now leaving the home and coming with us when we shop and that means your right. website must be mobile optimized for a tablet you must, you know, you must, you know. I also get frustrated when a web, when a comp, when a building, like I go in the Target. Target has free Wi-Fi. Yeah. I love that because how many times you get in the back of somewhere and you're going to browse or shop and you can't get phone access? They might lose my sale if I have to go outside of the building to get get cell phone access to make sure that this is what I needed for my Evernote or whatever it was. I think little right. things like that, when companies have to really think about that mobile experience for the customer beyond just 
the mobile website. I mean, I think we have to take this a step further, and like you said, that that customer experience using their devices is important. Right, and you know what you're seeing too is it's it's not a separate. It's really important not to think of it as a separate channel or separate experience. But you know, to your point, uh, if you're in a physical store, that mobile and social are part of that experience. And so, what you see is people may be in the store asking questions either of Target or of their network about you know maybe a large screen you know you know HDTV or something like that right while they're in the store and engaging with Target on Twitter rather than if you know somebody actually you know in the store um, and I think that's also where it comes this you know this idea of um, the real time being the right time. You know, yes. a lot of times people will engage and say, you know, tweet out a Twitter handle or tweet out something, and and they really want to get interaction. But sometimes, like if you're actually at the store, I mean, the, your time window for someone to reply to you is actually you know extremely narrow. But the times where I've got someone's reply back in that time window where I'm still at the store, maybe I'm even still at the mall, like that to me is a huge advantage. I mean, like that's that's really where I'm I'm like, well, I'd I'd rather purchase this in the store today than going shopping on Amazon even if I'm paying you know five or eight dollars more but because right. they're interacting they're engaged they care so when we when we think about the evolution of so we're talking about mobile and the customer experience how does content come in play from there and even how does technology affect this content when we're trying to build these relationships and and, and these 360 networks yeah so you know really I think technology is upping the game Right, it makes it easier to create content today, um, and enables uh, you know people, individuals, and brands to better serve you know their buyers, their customers, their communities, you know with greater value. And uh, personally, I'm really excited about the resurgence of multimedia. Really, where you have um, you know different people connect with and resonate with information or stories. Uh, in different uh, formats, and so I really love that today we have, you know, really the resurgence of audio. We've talked a lot about podcasts here, video, or graphics, and you know, humans are by very nature visual beings, right? We process visual cues thousands of times faster than we can uh, textual uh, information, and um, you know, technology is enabling. It, it's much easier for all of us who are in different client engaging roles. You know, if, if you're coming from a services perspective, a marketing perspective, or sales perspective, it makes it easier. Um, but at the same time, there's a little bit of a flip side to that. You know, other edge to that sword, and that expectations are going up. So um, I think you know, technology is driving or raising the bar higher and higher. I think. Uh, particularly for you know people in some kind of a you know selling capacity, and the other thing, um, <laughs> sorry, I'll I'll let you jump in here, is I think technology is and content is bringing market is blurring the lines between marketing and sales, so that the people I see being successful selling um, are incorporating many skills around uh, you know positioning and messaging and storytelling. Um, and media that might, you know, historically even just three years ago come from a, a marketing core competency. Well, and it's, you know, I, I, I like to think of it as the, the greatest salesperson in my life is my dad. My dad was a sales guy all of his life, and, and you know, he's also the best storyteller I ever have known. And I, <laughs> I, I talk a lot, and you put my dad and I together, we talk a real lot. And, and but, you know, he always <laughs> was, you know, when he, and we, we joke, if my dad rides first class on an airplane, even if it's a puddle hopper from Pittsburgh to Virginia Beach where we used to we lived, he would he would know everything about that person that he sat next to on the airplane. Because my dad story tells, he relates, he engages. And when we talk about how you can leverage social <laughs> my dad just tweeted me and said he's watching. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 he texted. He texted, and the text popped up. That's funny. But um, you know, one of the, yeah, one of the things that you know for me was a, a was a big thing that I learned early on was now we can take these technologies and we can take this content and we can really leverage it to tell that story and relate in these new ways. Yeah. My dad, you know, I used that quote where he said, you know, an email can never replace a handshake. 
Well, no, yeah. it can't replace it, but it can make that handshake a hug if you do a great job creating great contract, building great relationships with technology, with social media. And I think that's really where this is going. I love that. Uh, you know, I, I, what's the what's the name of the the campaign or the series that you have running with the mobile? I can't remember the hashtag right now off the top of my head. Oh, um, yeah, there are a series of events. Uh, there's actually one tomorrow in San Francisco, and it's. Uh, Engagement reimagined, be mobile, work social, and you can uh, follow that hashtag, be mobile, work social, or if you're around the San Francisco area, I'd really invite you to come, and you just go to bemobileworksocial.com. Perfect. Well, de we'll definitely make sure to get that tweeted out there, because yeah. I actually was, I, I think you and I originally were engaging on that, and I looked into the, the concept, and I love that tagline, be mobile, you know, it, you know work social, because I think part of the problem we kind of, uh, and I was actually taping a little episode this morning, we were talking about you know, personal branding, and if you had 15 minutes, what could you do? And and there's so many things you can do, but for me, utilizing mobile whenever I'm in the doctor's office to tweet or engage back, or if I'm, you know, on a conference call, and not all conference calls are boring, but if I'm a conference call and it's not something that I'm fully engaged in, I will right. take that time to engage and, and, and um, you know, build relationships. So I think of mobile is that is that connection that allows us to really, you know, take it full advantage of these social you know, down times. And yes, we all, yes. there's good times to be disconnected, but there's also advantage to that. So one of the other things I was curious about, you you have a podcast for social selling. You have a podcast, uh, and I don't, not social selling as in the whole. You have one that's Ask Jim, because you really believe in the, the conversations and community. And then you have your newest one where you're talking social business. So this one's a little, this will be a curveball question that we didn't really have planned. But I'm curious, when, you, when you're breaking down these three different aspects, community, social selling, and social business, do you see a blur of all the topics and the, and the core uh, competencies being you know, very similar now? Or is it still, you know, the sales conversation still a little bit different than the social business conversation? Yeah, I think it's, it's blurring a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, depending on how you engage in social, it would be a little bit different if uh, I do a lot of things around coaching and, and wet workshops and things around digital leadership. And so uh, one common maybe misperception I see a lot is, well, what, you know, gee, what's the difference between all this social media and social business and social selling and leadership? You know, are they, are they the same thing? I mean, there certainly are a lot of key platforms and tools that one might incorporate or leverage across uh, different roles, but much like what you, we've done for you know years and years and years, um, someone in a selling capacity would approach and engage people perhaps I think with a different mindset and slightly different intention and um, outcome in a sales role than maybe as a leader where you're more focused around providing direction and guidance strategy and trying to leverage social to have more of a you know a, a, you know interactive bi-directional uh, discussion and dialogue right um, versus you know other people who might be in a more tactical marketing you know demand generation role so I mean I think there's some blurring but I still think it comes down to and this relates to what you were talking about with your dad um, Everything that your dad does in terms of storytelling and engagement, you know, are, are things that we've been doing as you know as humans, right? Engaging with other people, all businesses, people engaging with people. But we've been doing storytelling and connecting on a, you know on personal and business levels since the beginning. Um, social now just facilitates that uh, so that we can do it more easily with more people and allows us to connect you know with more people but you know fundamental principles of different roles uh, and the intentions and mindsets of those different roles I think uh, supersede the underlying you know kind of social aspects of it when we're talking maybe social media or social business um, but I don't know if that answers your question it does, and actually, um, jo John Golden and Dave Stein, two of our previous guests, had a couple good comments on there. One of them, you know, beware of echo chambers. Make sure your content is useful, targeted, purposeful, and contextualized. I think John oh. nailed, nailed that well, one. Plus one thousand to that. Yeah, yes. I, you know, I don't know. I, I have a personal thing with that. You know, 
I think everyone, first and foremost, um, you know, have have a perspective, <laughs> have have a point of view. Yes, and, and I, I say all the time, people follow you for you, not to be an RSS feed or a, a echo chamber. So I, I yes. completely agree. And actually, <laughs> yeah. one of the other one, I've uh, you know said you know technology forces the evolution of contact form, and I I often yeah. think. Although technology has allowed us to create content easier, that doesn't mean all the content we're creating is great content. And I, right. I would, you know, we're still way too many people creating content just for content's sake, or because they said that if you don't post to your website once a day every day, you're going to lose your SEO value. Well, right. who cares about your SEO value if you're not printing, providing any value in the first place? All right. those links are going to fall on dead ears to begin with. Wow. So I think you know, that that's important. Yeah, and. Uh... I'll I'm happy to debate this with anybody, but I really think today, great content is the new SEO. Um, you know, and I really think, to your point, great content will draw people, will engage people, and um, you know, lead you know to engagement with a community. Um, and you know, it's regardless of whatever the rules and mechanics of the SEO continue to transform. Uh, you know, focusing on great content, and I see your book there in the background, Utility. You know, our good friend Jay Bayer talks about this all the time. You know, content is king, yes. But it's, and you mentioned this, it's context. So I think uh, one of the biggest things I like to talk about with people, um, particularly in sales roles in le and leadership roles, is to focus on context. So one thing you can... Uh, do instead of having this echo chamber where you're just really just resharing the same content, um, what's your point of view on it? What's from all of your experience, you know, in your in your career and in your expertise around the particular um, you know role you're in? What what context? What insights? What perspectives can you add to that to you know create even additional value or help your community? And your audience or your network um, get more value out of that, and better net down uh, what might be in a particular article or a new white paper or you know a new solution offering or announcement. Now, what's the context? Why is this important? Yeah, I completely agree. I think the folks here in social selling are know my thoughts on content curation. Um, uh -huh. For exactly. sure, you know, it's all about the context and um, there are a lot of great tools out there that can help you do that. And there's yeah. just, people have been hearing the same advice, like you need to keep producing your own content, you encourage your team to produce content. So we have this like overwhelming mass of content and a lot of it's just really shitty. So I was kind of yeah. curious, there was another tweet from John who's actually, he's on fire today and he said that, you know, a downside is that it's too easy for us to produce useless content. So with all of these yeah. self-publishing options, you know, publisher, medium, um, where do you think the pendulum is going to swing next? I mean, I think have we gone all the way to one side of the mass-produced content, or what are your predictions for the future? Well, I, I, have, I, I have one for that. I just want to jump in. I have something that just I think I think it's up to us, the community, to stop sharing crappy content. Like I mean, well, you need noisy. to read. <laughs> You don't even know because you haven't actually read it. That's true. Great yeah. point. And Rachel, that, that blog post from your point, like, you know, if people aren't even reading the content and they're sharing it because of the person that – I think that's part of the root – one of the root causes of the, the problem is we're just sharing it for sharing sake or creating it, you know, and that just divulges the problem. But, you know, I work really hard, and I know some of, like, the great people that are doing social great – Every piece of content they share is great content, and it's not because they only read great content. They just filter all that crap out of their feed, and I think that's the difference between tweeting 200 articles a day and 50 great articles a day. Right, right, and you know, I think in you know, for any any individual, uh, retweeting, you know, simply sharing, you know, content without adding any additional value or really understanding what it is you're sharing, which can by itself come back and bite you if there's something inappropriate in there or, you know that might be counter to your your values or your brand um, but you know I think what we're gonna start to see is you know people you know people are just gonna get smarter around who you know who are those trusted uh, influencers so you know 
those that I think take a you know a little more initiative, like you said, filter content. Look for what's really valuable for my community and for those that I'm trying to serve. Um, people will appreciate that and gravitate toward those people, right? Um, and uh, you know, so I, I think that's going to create some kind of a, a filtering process, and also technology itself, which we talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, and Brian, you, you know, you were there for the announcement of IBM Verse, and uh, so you know, this is just an example of an offering. Of of course, I'm a little biased, you know, from IBM, but there are other offerings out there, and all these great tools are also helping us to better filter. Uh, you know this fire hose of uh, information first in our e inbox, but now also in social. Yeah, so I, I think I analytics to... are going to help weed out the wheat from the you know from the chaff. So and I think you know that... IBM Watson. I, I've demoed. I've played with IBM Watson. I was in the beta testing, and I I just love the idea that I have the access to analytics that. You know, yes. I'm not worried about beating Jeopardy. I'm I'm then taking you know, and I think part of the IBM verse, and I, and I I tweeted about this when I after I demoed IBM verse was its focus on the people and the yeah. social conversations that you're having, right. not the email message, which is what I think is the stale element of it. And I think that's right. the, the true root of a great sales co is the conversation you have. It's not messages back and forth, right? Right. It's a conversation. And um, so I, and one of the other things I know, uh, Jill Raleigh. Uh, tweeted at me to ask, you know, I, I, I firmly believe about the power of using other people's content, resharing it. Content curation is is yeah. probably the number one way that I got my brand, my personal brand recognized, was mm -hmm. I found great people like Jay Bear. Jay Bear, I mean, I went to five Jay Bear uh, events this year where he was keynoting, <laughs> and I was live tweeting live. He's my everywhere. Picture. He is. He is everywhere. And he, and he, talks, he talks and presents in tweetables. Like if you could, if you could take, you know, Jay is a great lesson on what you have to be doing when you're presenting today. Because his slides are very tweetable; they're all orange, great text to take a picture of, and yeah. he tweet, he he talks in tweetables. But you know, like I started doing that, and people were like, "Wow, you're in Jay Bear is retweeting your stuff," and I'm like, "Well, because I'm promoting his message." And it's you know, when you promote, you know, this is this was our conversation we had um, last week on on Social Selling Hour was, you know, not anyone, no one's gonna trust someone if you said you know everything. So when you yeah. find and learn stuff from someone else, sharing other people's content and mm -hmm. curating and even adding your own insight, that's true power. I mean, like, and, and I'll put it in the offline sense is that, you know, when someone references, hey, you know, did you see something in the newspaper, which I still am, am bothered by the fact that newspapers are still around because I consider that <laughs> old news. Um, but that's a whole other rant for another time on the newspaper thing. My dad will disagree with that for sure. Yeah. But you know, like the idea that when you're, when you're quoting, you know, it's that water cooler conversation, but you're, yeah. you're sharing your knowledge on what you learn. And, and, and Dom Garrett, uh, a good friend of ours, uh, not only the community but on, on Twitter, was you know, talking about you know, engaging with the content you're sharing. And John Golden said, do you want to be known for sharing a lot of content or do you want to be known for sharing great content? Right. That's probably a good question. We need to go around to some of these social media gurus and ask them that question again and say, you know, I, I first would like to quiz them on the 400 articles they shared that day, how many of that, that, them they read, or I yeah. want to put like a UTM tracker on there and see if they've ever actually clicked the link themselves. But, um, you know, I think that's um, another aspect here. And when we're talking, so 360 Network. We're talking all these things with building relationships. We're using content to build relationships. We're leveraging mobile and technology to build relationships. One of the things that I'm curious about from not only your experience but your role, because I, I love that your your job, I, I'm envy of your uh, of role at IBM. When you think about how you're getting people to relate better with customers and relate better with uh, not only your customers but internal uh, folks, what's usually the first hurdle or roadblock they run into that you hear and how, how do you kind of talk them through that? On how... Um... I'm like maybe like you know so their boss saying why do you need to be in touch with the product management team you have no business talking to them you're a sales guy get outside and go stand there at happy hour because there's ROI there there's not ROI you know inside well so at IBM I mean I'm very you know fortunate and grateful I think uh, you know we've got great leadership with Ginny Rometty who really gets it and you know engagement is one of our three pillars on going forward and you know along with cloud and analytics and security and a few other things but engagement is you know in IBM it's embraced 
as part of our path forward. That is our path forward, and so there's, uh, you know, very much encouraged uh, these concepts of brand advocacy and networks and sharing our knowledge. Uh, Jenny says this all the time. It's not about what you know, but about what you share. But taking that outside, you know, with a, with businesses and organizations that we're working to help and our partner ecosystem, um, you know, you do you do face those challenging questions, uh, you know, to the point, you know, skepticism or just uncertainty. I think a lot of times it comes down to fear. People just, you know, uh, fear of the unknown and, you know, potential risk. So I think people, what they don't know, um, you know, can seem risky. So I think one of the things, uh, at least I like, you know, to start with and many of my colleagues is really starting with the why and, and trying to help people understand the why of, you know, openness, you know, transparency, engagement, conversation. Um, it's funny, it's, it's funny you, you know, say that because it's. I know it's not an IBM like uh, soap opera. Because I actually yeah. was lucky enough. I sat in the IBM design uh, team um, at IBM Watson there in New York. I get to sit with the design team and on how they're redoing the concept of design. And the idea is they're re they're asking why to the question. They're requestioning yeah. the question. And I I absolutely okay. love that because it was they we went through an entire exercise where they were like draw us a vase. And everybody drew the exact same vase. And then he said, well, actually, draw us a new way to display flowers in your house. And you should have seen, like, people had water-infused yes. tables. <laughs> they had, I mean, everything yeah. you could imagine. It was because it was the same, you know, idea. We're just, we're asking that why. And I think that's a, a powerful, you know, comment that you made there. Because not only is IBM leading the charge with that, but I think IBM is doing that in all different aspects. You're teaming up with mm -hmm. Twitter. So now you're getting social data and going to take social data to the next level. You partner with Apple, which, as an Apple fanboy, that excited me oh, almost yeah. as much as the Twitter partnership. But yeah. you know, like those kind of things, like I think those are really powerful. Requestion, you know, being afraid of what you don't know is partially the problem because people aren't training, and training mm -hmm. is something that I think has always missed the mark. And I, as someone that you know, that was my background was was technical training and social business oh, okay. training and, and security training. So all of the training side, I love that. I I was very lucky. I got the brief the Joint Chief of Staff on how cybersecurity was being trained across the Department of Defense, and and it was because the Joint Chief of Staff staff knew cyber could only be successful if it was they invested in training. Right. And I wish that they would do the same in these businesses on social and on content, and even mm -hmm. train them on basic engagement tactics. Yeah. Well, that's why we have things like this great website, ExecutiveSocialAcademy.com. I mean, I'm just trying to help people. Um, you know, make this journey, and I really think of this as a journey. I think uh, I hear this a lot from people, particularly uh, you know leaders. You know, gee, I can't make the, I can't just you know switch overnight, or how do I? People feel like they have to make this change overnight, and so I try and uh, talk about the concept of well, how do you walk a mile? You know, seventeen hundred and fifty individual steps, right? So um, you know, it's a journey. It's a it's a process and it's a shift and sometimes it you know some people get it right away and some people it takes a little bit of time um, but it's just it's a shift in how we work you know to a more open you know transparent and co manner so you know cooperative collaborative you know co-creating so um, you know but different organizations you know are getting there at different at speeds but we see this, I talk about this, you know, a lot in these talks, we talk about in the Be Mobile Work Social events, the pace setters. And what we see working with, literally, you know, because we're such a big organization, we work with thousands, Country. you know, <laughs> of, of, you know clients. <laughs> and you really see those that are embracing mobile and social, uh, social business, all the different pieces of it, uh, really starting to outpace, you know, competition. So I think going into 2015, I think, you know, this notion of like a digital divide is really going to start to form uh, across not just retail, but, you know, other industries as well, including banking, you know, insurance, finance. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, how that progresses. But, I, you know, it's, it's an undeniable force. And, you know, you look at the shift in the demographics of the workforce. 
right, with emerging. We just had a recent um, podcast, uh, Social Business Unboxed. I think it was episode eight. We talk about millennials as emerging leaders and emerging consumers, and this whole shift in expectations, you know, as a consumer in whatever business, and as a, you know, as as a member of the workforce and as a young and emerging leader, um, <laughs> these are significant changes. So um, I'm really curious to see, you know, if this continues to accelerate at the pace that it is now. Yeah, I agree with everything that you're saying. And I think for me, my prediction is that everyone truly needs to embrace that mindset of continuous learning and yeah. accepting that you may never be the master of your craft because social business is ever evolving. So we're yeah. all continuously learning. I think that's really hard for people to accept that, yeah, you're, you may be at the top of your game, but you still have to keep learning. Yeah. Um, and especially for people who, you know, they're sea level, so it's hard for them to adopt these new tactics, but it's completely necessary to be successful. Yeah, and, you know, I think um, going back to that last statement, I think, you know, I think of, uh, we joke about this all the time, I'm a 46-year-old millennial, <laughs> but... I think it's more, and you know, Brian Solis talks about this all the time. Generation C, you know, and to your point, Rachel, it's really a mindset, right? It's it has nothing really, to, you know, to do with necessarily with age or you know any kind of demographic or segmentation or where you live in the world. Um, it's just a mindset, but it's you know it's a shift and it's accelerating and building momentum. And I think that's part of it right there is just educating that, you know, and I, that, that was my soapbox at the, the New Way to Work event was I was, yes. I kept stressing the fact that, you know, it's, when you, when you refer to a millennial, don't look at me, picture someone that's a digitally connected person. It doesn't, it's not because of the year they were born, it's because of their mindset, their philosophy, what they want to get done. And we, and when, if we don't shift that as marketers or even as, as sales, you're going to miss the boat every time because when yeah. someone says millennials, and they say, oh, it's the ones that have the beanies on or the ones that are wearing jeans, you're, you're completely missing the entire demographic that are the people that you want to hit. I mean, we have to reshift that. And I think that's my, you know, my prediction of 2015 is like we're going to start to – we're going to lead that change. And people that mm -hmm. are missing that and their, their focus on millennials are only an age group, they're the ones that are going to miss out on all of us leading change. And, you know, like part of the reason, you know, a selfish reason that Rachel and I started Social Selling Hour is – we wanted to learn from the best of the best like yourself. What better way than to have a show, ask you guys to come on, and I get to ask you guys questions. I mean, this yeah. is I, mean, <laughs> I, I get to learn every Monday. You know, it's, it's a very selfish thing, and I will fully admit it now that I'm 29 weeks into the show. I might not have admitted that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we no, go, but... but I mean, it goes like that on the podcast, you know, like, I, and I also feel like it's our job, you know, someone asked me about being an influencer, and I always said, I always dreamed of, like, if I was ever someone that people felt they could learn from, I wanted to share as much and as often as I could, because when, when we're growing up, and this goes back to Dave Stein's comment, uh, to, you know, you, you're going to remember your friends on the way up, and they're going to remember you on the way down, like, you know, like that concept where, you know, not only was I taught never to burn bridges, yeah. But I was turned, you know, like respecting my elders. That doesn't mean I have to follow like a sheep and not have my own opinion. But respect yeah. gets you a lot of a lot of things. And I think, you know, some people forget that. Some people believe that they must, you know, Brian Solis, who I, I know you quoted, and is probably one of my favorite authors and person to read right now. Is you know, he he firmly believes on it's creating new customer experiences. But yes. it's not about disrupting all of the old ones. You know, maybe it's taking something as simple as a taxi. And having an app that gets you called Uber, and now we all know what the heck we, Ubering is a is a, a verb that we actually use. You're like, I think yeah. the the new experience is something powerful. So, Joe, I'm so glad you were able to come on. We have about five minutes left. Give people. We'll make sure they get out the links on your podcasts. Um, I'm subscribing now to all three as a as not only as a podcast junkie, but as as a fan of. Um, your thoughts and the people that you're able to bridge in there. So give us some uh, insights on things, exciting things that you have going on, or maybe uh, your one last nugget that you're excited for for 2015. Yeah, I think, you know, for 2015, uh, I think some of the big things, I think we're going to selling, you know, this whole notion of social selling versus selling, I really think it's just selling. And I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, going into 2015. Oh, that's I think, a topic for another day because I disagree. Uh, I <laughs> um, I really think you know we're starting to really see the rise 
of digital leaders. You know, there was a study that came out just the other day that said 80% of employees would prefer to work for a social CEO. I think that's going to start to drive a lot of shift. And people um, taking, you know, um, proactive, uh, being very proactive in their career and social businesses attracting and retaining and engaging top talent. I think you're going to start, you know, see more acceleration in the migration of talent to those organizations that get mobile social and versus those that don't um, because it's not just you know being mobile and social but the whole mindset that goes around that and an organization and that kind of a culture um, and you know I think continue things like you mentioned this uh, the partnership between IBM and Twitter you know social analytics and how that can help all organizations better listen I know that, Rachel, that's something important to you, right? Listening for unmet needs and signals with your community and your customers. Um, and I'm looking, you know, I think in 2015 we're really going to start to see this shift in the whole uh, kind of future of work, and I think of it as me as a service. So your value is, you know, we've talked about this a lot today, your skills. Your value is, is increasingly about your skills, your experience, and your network and those three together going with you wherever you go along with you know your mobile devices um, I think the, the thing is future I'm, I'm uh, on a speaking tour right now around these be mobile work social events we just uh, did Philadelphia last week that was a lot of fun um, a little cooler than California <laughs> but no snow which was great and uh, we're going to be in San Francisco tomorrow so if anyone's around there I'd encourage you to come and join us there in the, uh, Minneapolis uh, the week after. Awesome. So those are some things I'm looking forward to in uh, the near future. We've got some ebooks coming out on uh, digital leadership and uh, for digital sellers. And uh, beginning of next year, I'm looking forward to launching, you talked about this, Brian, training, uh, a social you set of courses for uh, client facing, you know, people in client engaging roles. So, yeah. Sure. That's awesome. That's great. And we're actually shifting our format in 2015 uh, to each month we're focusing on a specific topic and we're bringing in guests and panels. And I think one of the ones that, you know, now that we're talking about it, I think is training is going to be one of our ones. We had, um, oh, my, my name is going blank, the gentleman from APAC, Rachel, that was uh, running training. Oh, Tom Scotitis. Tom Scotitis, yes. Tom, Tom um, was talking about how, you know, so much of his focus is training not only his partners, yeah. his engagements, but I think training is a great one that we'll have to focus one of our months on in 2015 because I think that's really going to be one of the catalysts for driving, you know, turning social sellers that actually use the tool right. to, to, to amplify their already great sales skill sets because I think that's something that right. – Unfortunately, we're missing the boat on. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, you'll, your stuff is always in my feed because I'm always uh, sharing all the, the great content you have. Uh, yeah, we're very you. lucky. Our, uh, we actually have another Jim next week. We actually have Jim, <laughs> Jim, Jim Keenan uh, is actually our guest uh, next week wrapping up 2014 for us with back-to-back gyms. -back so uh, we're going to have a, a gym back-to-back -back week. So next Monday, uh, same time, same channel. Uh, Rachel, as always, thank you. Uh, we will see everyone again uh, next week and have a wonderful holiday. Thank you again, Jim. Thank you. Pleasure talking with you guys. Talk to you soon. Cheers.